Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Here for the live session uh, for About Islam. I'm just going to wait for a minute or two to check in with the um, support people at About Islam, Sister Nicola and uh, perhaps Catherine. And uh, we'll get started uh, very soon, inshallah. Does the sound okay? Sister Nicola, is the sound okay on your end? It's good. Okay, we'll get started, inshallah. Thank you to uh, Talisa, if I'm not saying it, hope I'm not saying it incorrectly. Thank you for letting me know that the sound is good. Uh, so, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. Uh, as always, we start with the, in the name of Allah uh, and we ask Allah to grant peace and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and upon all of those who are uh, following in his footsteps, his companions, uh, his family members, and all those who follow his footsteps until the day of judgment. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are among those who follow the example of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Welcome, Sister Dunya. Good to see you here. Um, <clears throat> so the topic for today is um, uh, a request for me to share some thoughts about how to uh, increase our faith. And uh, the reason for that uh, request is that uh, there are a lot of Muslims who are um, either born uh, into Muslim families and grow up uh, practicing Islam and prayer and fasting and in their uh, youth and in their young adult age they start to um, fall off and uh, stop praying or not praying as often and maybe losing some of the uh, vigor in their faith and their uh, and their beliefs, um, not so much to the extent that they leave Islam altogether, but um, that they are um, having a little bit of difficulty with uh, keeping up with uh, the requirements of uh, putting Islam into our daily lives. Also, we have the issue of uh, some people who come to Islam from other faiths or from. Um, not following any faith uh, specifically. Uh, so we call them converts or reverts or new Muslims. Um, a lot of times or sometimes uh, them starting off with a lot of uh, uh, zeal and uh, enthusiasm and wanting to be the best Muslim possible and then somewhere along the line they start to lose steam and uh, maybe falling off the same way that some of the young people in, uh, who are born into Muslim families are falling off. Uh, so this is um, obviously an important, um, an important issue and one that uh, needs to be kept in mind by uh, all of us who, uh, who call ourselves Muslims and do our best to practice our faith on a daily basis. And it's also an issue for leadership in our Muslim communities to pay attention to these uh, very important issues. So uh, how can a person um, sort of reinvigor themselves or invigorate their faith and enthusiasm for Islam and practicing it and, uh, and, uh, and that kind of thing? So I'm just going to share some thoughts. Um, as always, I like to remind people that I'm not an imam of Islam, I'm not a scholar. Um, I do practice my faith the best that I can on, uh, on a regular basis with prayer and fasting and trying to be in a good example, but I don't want anybody to think that I have the ability to offer fatwas or anything like that. I'm just uh, one of the Muslims of the Muslim community. Um, so uh, one of the thoughts that come to mind for me is... Um, that there needs to be some kind of balance in our life and 
when it comes right down to it, um, balance in Islam is the key to uh, success uh, in this life and in the next. There are no, there is no shortage of uh, influences on us to pull us in one direction or the other, whether it's uh, the way we live our lives or the way that we uh, view issues or our opinions about different things. But it's really important to be, um, as Allah called us, ummatun wasata, so a, a middle, uh, a middle ground type of uh, ummah or nation. So we have this uh, approach to faith and life in general that is balanced. It's not something that's extreme. We don't have extremes in the best example of what Islam should be. Uh, we don't go to extremes in our behavior. We don't go to extremes in our understanding of things, in our beliefs. We don't go to extremes in the way we treat each other. Uh, we try to maintain balance and try to um, create win-win situations uh, in our communities, in our, in our interactions, as much as possible. Um, so there's no uh, interest in dominating for the sake of being in power or for the sake of being right. Our goal as Muslims is to create peace and harmony in the places that we live and the people that we live with. Uh, so in the issue of balance to me is the is the key of all of those things. So when it comes to maybe losing some faith, um, when I think about uh, the way of uh, life that we have in the West or around the world, anywhere that has access to technology, is that we are becoming more and more isolated from each other. Uh, and I don't want to put down the efforts of our about Islam team, but an example is what we're doing right now is this live uh, session. And there are many blessings involved in these types of sessions in that you can uh, connect with people who you would never have the ability to connect with uh, in a normal or uh, in an area where you don't have uh, that uh, access to technology. So this live session is a blessing in many ways that we can literally connect people all over the world who just happen to be awake at this time of day in northern uh, Alberta and Canada. It's uh, 10 a.m. Uh, but around the world is obviously not that easy. But nonetheless, we have the ability to connect with people in uh, all parts of the world uh, at the same time. So this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, on the other side of it, when we are too immersed in technology of this type, and we have this thing in our hands all the time, and we're always referring to it even when we're with other people. We'd be sitting at dinner and looking at this little machine and ignoring the people that are in front of our faces. So this is an imbalance in our nature as human beings. We're social. We're not... Uh, we're not built to be alone and living in a cave somewhere or in our basement in front of a computer screen. We're not designed for that. We're designed to go out and do things. So if you want to have a look at where I am, it might be a little bit uh, daunting, but it's uh, minus 23 <laughs> Celsius with a wind chill of minus 35. So it's not the, you don't see too many people out there. Um, but there's, uh, we adapt living in this part of the world and uh, we still get out at this time we have uh, winter games in our city uh, and people are in our city um, outside and I'm watching uh, youth uh, participate in sports and competitions which is an amazing uh, opportunity uh, people from all over our province getting together and uh, having fun and watching kids have fun and competing uh, so this is uh, uh, called the Alberta Winter Games in our region, and uh, our city's been op uh, uh, fortunate enough to host this year. So we need to get out of this mindset of being stuck to this little machine and isolating ourselves. And what it does is we pull ourselves away from people, and instead of talking face-to-face, -face, um, we text each other, or we send pictures, or we uh, social media uh, each other, um, into depression and into um, isolation and this is not a healthy thing for us as human beings so we need to get away from this thing once in a while um, and this kind of reminds me of a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, where he said نعمتاني مغبون فيه ما كثير من الناس الصحة والفراغ and the general um, meaning of that is there are two blessings 
that um, people are sort of taking for granted. Uh, Mavbunun, I think, has the connotation of injustice. So you're not doing justice to the time that you have, the free time, and the health that you have. You're taking advantage of your health uh, or taking it for granted. And we take uh, the free time we have for granted. We don't understand, we don't really know how much time we have in this life. Uh, none of us really knows if we'll be here tomorrow. We have no guarantee, and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where we will end and, and uh, what time and, uh, and all of those things. So we should not take advantage or take for granted the time that we have, and we should not take it for granted the uh, good health that we have, because you don't know when you will lose that good health. And there's no guarantee that I will have great health, alhamdulillah, I have uh, good health now, but there's no guarantee that that's going to last forever. forever. Um, so we need to use these two blessings as much as we can in the way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleasing to God. And uh, scholars will say, and um, I would never disagree with them, that uh, to increase the amount of prayer that we do, increase the amount of du'a that we do, increase the amount of fasting, and good deeds in general. Uh, but everything uh, in the universe, uh, from the perspective of uh, what's halal and haram, everything is halal. But there's a few things that are haram, and we should stay away from them. And they're all well known. We know what haram is, and we know that uh, for the most part, it's not hard to stay away from it. But... Um, Obviously, you want to be involved in activities with other Muslims. Associate with other Muslims who keep you uh, reminded of the blessing that you have of being a Muslim. You want to uh, do things that are good for your health, good for your uh, mind, good for your body, and not just sit watching TV or sitting in front of the computer or in front of your electronic device and think that you are socializing with people because... It is to a certain extent, but it's not really this face-to-face -face that we really miss. I was listening to the news uh, on the radio not too long ago, and they were talking about the uh, boom, pretty much, in the sales of board games. And they said it's like uh, billions of dollars each year uh, in the sale of board games. And as you know, a board game like uh, Monopoly or even something like chess or anything where you're sitting face to face with somebody in front of a board with cards and dice and little um, little men that you use to move through the, the, the game is a face to face uh, interaction that everybody, uh, most people really enjoy. So uh, I think that the result of the cause of that boom is the fact that people are becoming or feeling more and more isolated because of these kinds of things and uh, seeking out ways to get together with their family members or with their friends and loved ones, uh, co-workers, uh, associate sometimes outside of work, and they get together and they have some fun face-to-face. -face. And this is uh, halal, obviously, as long as the nature of the game <laughs> is halal. Uh, nothing haram in Monopoly. The only time that it could be haram is if it's the time for prayer and the adhan is heard and everybody sits down and continues to play Monopoly. <laughs> So as long as you say, okay, time for salah, and you get up and you pray, and then go back to the game, no problem, alhamdulillah. Um, at the same time, we don't want to get too involved in distractions of this life. Uh, we want to do our best to take care of the needy and to visit the elderly and to um, remind ourselves of our mortality and visit the graveyard once in a while, um, help, around, help out around our community, uh, we have the Winter Games in town right now, and there are thousands of people volunteering to make sure the visitors are taken care of, and this is a part of Islam, taking care of the wayfarer, the visitor, the traveler. Um, we're hosting them in our city, and it's a great uh, way to um, get out and meet people and, um, and be hospitable, and that's, um, that's a good thing. Um, and members of the Muslim community are involved, and actually one of our uh, imams in the community is acting as a driver to go between events to help people uh, get to uh, the different venues. May Allah uh, reward him for that. 
He's uh, an ambassador of Islam, and he's putting his faith into action, and uh, may Allah reward him. Uh, so we do not um, usually take care of our health either. We eat things that, uh, and I'm as bad at this as everybody else, we eat things that we're not supposed to eat regularly, uh, but we get lazy and we have convenience and we want uh, things that taste good all the time, and we don't pay attention to our health, we don't exercise, we don't uh, do all of the things that we need to do to preserve our health. And uh, the body that Allah has given us is a uh, has rights upon us. So if we have uh, poor health, we have to take steps to increase uh, our status of our health, to eat right and to exercise and to sleep uh, enough and to um, uh, take care of the body that Allah gave us because you don't know when you will lose that uh, body. With respect to um, uh, people born into the faith of Islam in their families, I think to some extent we've um, we've grown up um, following directions without questioning sometimes, and we don't ask why do we have to do this and why is this haram and why that. Some kids are brave enough, and some parents are merciful enough to sit and explain and to talk. But sometimes the parents aren't knowledgeable enough to sit and explain. And uh, they just know that that's the way they were taught and you have to do it and that's all there is to it. Uh, so that's not enough uh, for many children. They're very curious. They want to know why is this haram or why is it bad to do that or why should I spend so much time in prayer and why should I spend so much effort to fast and why should I share my money and uh, all of these things are questions that people have and they have a right to have a good answer. So if parents are not able to... Um, offer suggestions or, or advice or those kinds of things, then they should not be shy to direct uh, their kids to people who do have the ability to answer. And that's where we have the blessing of uh, scholars and imams in our community and teachers, um, uh, experienced elders and things like, and people like that who can help with uh, uh, helping us understand the reasons for uh, the way of life in Islam. And Allah does not uh, ask us to do what we are unable to do. He does not put a burden upon us that we can't bear. Um, and there is no reason for, um, well, there's no benefit to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we pray or we don't, or if we fast or if we don't. We are not, Allah is not the one benefiting from it. It's we are, who are benefiting from it. So it's important to understand these things when we're sometimes going through the motions of salah and uh, we're not paying attention to what we're, what we're saying in the Salah and we're not focused. Um, sometimes we have uh, a faith that kind of goes up and then it comes down and it goes up and then it comes down. And, but that's the nature of, of faith and that's the nature of life in general. Sometimes things are awesome and going great and sometimes they're not. And you have to be maintaining that balance, as I said, to uh, make it through. Uh, when good times are here, we make sure that we don't forget Allah and forget the um, the blessings that He has given us and be thankful for that. And when times are tough, we should not lose hope and not give up on uh, our faith, uh, not forget Allah at that time either. So it's a matter of uh, maintaining balance, as I said. Uh, sometimes when it comes to um, new Muslims, or sorry, born Muslims, we uh, start to question things or question like I said why is this haram and why is this halal and <clears throat> in uh, religious studies um, scholars will tell you that uh, there's kind of a uh, growing uh, concept of growing up in the village where you're surrounded by people of your community of your type of your faith of whatever you want to call it and at a certain point, you want to leave the village and you want to explore the world and see what it has to offer. And on a religious journey, uh, everybody embarks on it at one time or another. You are leaving the village to explore other understandings, philosophies, religious beliefs, to compare them to what you've been taught and to see if uh, something better is out there or something more meaningful. Um, and it's just a natural thing that people... Uh, look at their own uh, life and practice and religious beliefs and they start to question things. Uh, very very often it's people who are young and uh, uh, looking for you know 
opportunities to explore and to understand new things and see and do new things. And this is a natural thing and it's a good thing. But um, what usually happens is that people leave the village, so to speak, with respect to their faith and they explore and go to see the world and then most of the time they return to the village and they come back to their roots, they come back to their uh, asl, as we say in Arabic, the, uh, the foundation of who they are and they are satisfied that the route or the path that they are on is the best path. And for the most part, uh, we don't see Muslims dropping like flies, as they say, because of the injustices in Islam or the nonsensical, nonsensical doctrines and that kind of thing. Uh, Islam is a very simple uh, and at the same time very deep faith. And um, it's something that anybody can understand. Allah is one, there is only one God. And it's not possible for there to be more than one. And Muhammad is his servant and messenger. Uh, we have the example of the Prophet as a way of understanding Islam and practicing it. And uh, we have the Quran as a uh, literally uh, avenue for Allah or God to talk to us directly. And many, many people who read the Quran for the first time feel like it is speaking to their heart directly. And this is one of the miracles of the Qur'an. So we have to return to the Qur'an, reflect on it. We have to stay close to the believers. We have to um, try to avoid peer pressure as much as possible. In uh, societies where there are people of different backgrounds and religious beliefs and traditions and ways of life, uh, peer pressure can be very, very powerful, especially for young people who may be on this uh, j uh, religious journey. They've left the village and they're exploring. And sometimes the draw of um, uh, relationships with, uh, other, uh, with other female, for a male looking for relationships with women or men, women looking for relationships with men, we can cross the line and uh, do things that we are taught were um, not allowed and uh, sometimes we suffer the consequences of it and find out a little too late that mom and dad were right or the imam was right or the brother that I used to talk to and hang out with was right or the sister. Uh, so, But most of the time people, uh, as I said, are not falling off of the slam and dropping like flies. It's a matter of um, exploring the world and exploring other understandings, philosophies. Most of the time people return to the village and they return to their roots. Uh, but it's a matter of patience and it's with the people who are around, uh, people who are uh, leaving the village uh, to keep uh, close to them and to um, continue to encourage to uh, practice their faith and to uh, study it more deeply. I think the more you study Islam in, uh, in a deeper sense, the more you appreciate the many blessings of Islam. Uh, if we just take it at a lip service level, we just recite and we don't understand what we're reciting and we just bow our heads and bow our necks in Salah and we don't reflect on the fact that we're literally standing in front of God and uh, looking for forgiveness and looking for mercy. If we don't seek for something deeper, then we will fall off uh, to a certain extent and it feels like we're going through the motions. Um, for people who are um, new to Islam, sometimes they um, start off with a real enthusiasm and it's natural. I've seen many, many people um, in this situation and sometimes they feel like they have to be better Muslims than the ones who were born into Islam. And uh, it's very often the case that you see great examples of new Muslims who are far ahead of anybody who was born into a Muslim family in that they have understood uh, the core of Islam and they want to be the best Muslim that they can be. And they have gone far, far ahead of anybody who was born and lived in Islam for years and years in a very short time. Uh, but sometimes they can lose... Um, lose steam again, as I said, and uh, be a little discouraged. Uh, I reflected on this a little bit, and um, I think some of the uh, causes of that are um, not due to the new Muslims themselves. I think sometimes the uh, members of the Muslim community who have uh, been established or born into Islam uh, tend to let 
new Muslims fend for themselves after congratulating them and uh, encouraging them to, you know, come to the mosque and participate in activities. There's sometimes a disconnect between people born and raised uh, in the West here in Canada and the United States, for example, born here and grew up their lives here in this culture and this uh, way of life and don't really connect really well with people who were born in other Muslim countries and came to this part of the world to uh, find a better life and a more uh, financial success and those types of things. And sometimes there, there's a disconnect between them. Uh, so it's important for people who are um, from other countries, Muslims coming to Canada or coming to the United States or European countries, to um, in one sense learn to live as uh, people live in the West while preserving the, the core of their faith but um, if, we just, if we just try to transplant Islam of the Middle East or Islam of the Muslim country that we came from and make it exactly as it was back home we're going to fail and I think we should fail in that sense because um, Iraq for example is not Philadelphia <laughs> and uh, Alberta is not Egypt and uh, uh, Canada is not uh, Indonesia it's a different place it's a different culture it's a different way of doing things so Islam here should not look identical to Islam in a Muslim country in the other side of the world. Uh, the core of Islam does not change. You walk into a mosque anywhere in the world and you know exactly what to expect and exactly what uh, the practices are. But when it comes to living in that society, there are certain ways of doing things and certain um, things that are emphasized more than others. Uh, and those are uh, cultural that have no conflict with Islam, but it's the nature of that part of the world. So we need to um, we need to uh, encourage um, scholars and uh, people from uh, Muslim countries who came to live in this part of the world to uh, integrate and to uh, associate with people who are around them, their neighbors, their friends, their uh, co-workers, uh, to the extent that is acceptable as a Muslim. And um, that goes for us who are born and raised here and uh, those who have come to Islam here from other faiths or no faith. We need to be part of the community. We need to be an asset to the community. We need to uh, support each other regardless of what our be beliefs are. And uh, we need to protect each other regardless of what our cultures are or ba our backgrounds are. Uh, another issue that I find sometimes is that um, people who are new to Islam uh, still learning and they're still uh, um, trying to learn how to speak uh, Arabic better and those kinds of things. And the people who are established Arabic speakers and came from Muslim countries tend to disregard them a little bit. And I think that's not really fair. Uh, if you want to um, promote Islam or to um, help increase the numbers of Muslims uh, in, uh, in the community here. There's no way around uh, integrating with people and getting to know them and associating with them. If we just isolate ourselves from non-Muslims and say, well, that's too bad for them that they're not believers uh, and uh, as long as I protect myself and my family and uh, my friends, that's all that matters. And this is a poor attitude. Um, it reminds me of the hadith of the angel who was sent to destroy a town and he went to destroy the town and found a house of uh, believers, one house. He went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, uh, there's a house of believers in this town. Allah said to him, start with his house. Um, destroy that house first. And uh, we can take a lesson from that. Of uh, It's not enough to be a Muslim or a believer and ignore everybody else around you. It's your job to... Uh, try to uh, improve the, sta the state of those around you, try to help the, those around you who aren't believers to understand and believe and to know that there is one God and that you must worship uh, worship Him. 
and to share your faith, not to keep it to yourself and too bad for everybody else. Uh, so sometimes as uh, uh, Arabic speakers especially, I'm sorry to say, um, come to Canada or United States and Western countries and they have such an enthusiasm for establishing Islam and Muslim communities and, um, and protecting them and don't give enough attention to uh, new Muslims and uh, disregard their uh, knowledge, number one, their wisdom, number two, and their experiences, number three, of growing up in this part of the world. You can't make da'wah to people if you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know what experiences they've had. You don't know where they're coming from. And um, sometimes, sorry to say, um, there's a little bit of arrogance uh, involved in uh, members of the Muslim community who, towards new Muslims and uh, Muslims born uh, into Muslim families in this country. So they're, for example, somebody like me, who um, born and raised in Canada, and my Arabic is not as good as uh, that of people who are born and raised in other countries, uh, in Arab or Muslim countries, and sometimes uh, you feel a little bit uh, neither part of this world nor the other, and you're stuck in the middle and uh, uh, it can be a very difficult experience. So uh, there's a little bit of arrogance sometimes in the uh, Muslim community that while well, he's a new new Muslim or he was born here, he doesn't know that much. Or he's not able to take leadership of different things that... Um, or she's not uh, uh, well versed in Hadith or Quran or not enough to help other people to uh, learn about Islam or that kind of thing. But I think that's a mistake. You hear so many stories of people who came to Islam, and they never met an imam, and they never went to a Friday khutbah, and they never went to, you know, study the Quran in depth first. There was something that appealed to them, and they were, uh, their heart was uh, grabbed by that. An example is somebody who heard the adhan once, and they didn't, un they didn't understand it. They didn't know what uh, what it was all about, but it hit them or they heard the Qur'an being recited, they didn't understand what the words were, they didn't know what it was even, and they get affected by that. And it draws their attention to it, and they they see beauty in it, even though they have no idea what uh, the words mean. Uh, so we need to um, give credit to the experiences of people, whether they're born in this country or born in another country. Uh, new Muslims need to be given uh, credit for uh, the knowledge and the wisdom and the experiences that they have and they can bring much to the uh, the da'wah, I guess you could say, of uh, Islam in this part of the world. Um, another, A good example of that is um, the people of Turkey. They don't speak Arabic for the most part and by all measures, from my point of view, they're doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, they're uh, very devout, they're uh, very successful as a society, as a country, and they always have been. And they're not Arabs, and uh, the Pakistanis are not Arabs, they're doing pretty well. Indonesians are not Arabs, they're doing pretty well. So give people credit, they're human beings, they have knowledge, they have skills, they have wisdom. Their culture is based on goodness, it's not based on, uh, for the most part, uh, injustice and those kinds of things. Even if you study uh, indigenous cultures or indigenous peoples, you see that there is great wisdom and great uh, justice in the way that their cultures are set up. So uh, we don't need to assume that everything non-Muslim or non-Arabic is bad and everything uh, is found where we came from. Uh, so I, I think I've uh, probably talked too much on that. <laughs> I only have uh, roughly half an hour. I've gone over that. Uh, so if there are any... Um, uh, questions uh, or comments. I've been seeing them at the bottom there, but I don't know if I'm addressing them or not. If anybody wants to, uh, I'll check with uh, Sister Nicola. If there's anything other than those two questions that people uh, brought up. Or if uh, you'd like me to wrap up, uh, you can let me know that too. I don't know if I should touch the screen here. I might, make, might wreck something. There's a lot of comments. Uh, everything's.
is good when intentions are correct. I'm thankful to Allah for Facebook and the genius who created it. <laughs> yes, many blessings there. All good, perfect things are from the Lord. Proverbs, moderation in all things. Yes. Moderation in all things is a very good advice. <clears throat> so if uh, there aren't any uh, uh, questions that people would like to direct, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the brothers and sisters at About Islam for the opportunity to speak. And um, I hope I've offered uh, something of uh, value to uh, new Muslims who are maybe losing some steam and also to the people born into Muslim families who are feeling like they're uh, not as... Uh, enthusiastic or invigorated as they felt they used to be. Um, hopefully you've uh, offered some thoughts to uh, improve the situation for people. If I have uh, said anything uh, good or correct, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I have said anything incorrect, it's from my own ignorance and uh, inabilities. Uh, so Jazakumullah khair, may Allah reward you all. And uh, thank you for uh, spending time with me and with the About Islam uh, team uh, today. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.